So good evening, everyone. I'm Lawrence O'Keefe with Friends of the Napanee River. In partnership with Friends of the Salmon River, this is our second last in our Zoom-based winter webinar series for this year. We will be recording a session so you can post it, so, so, so we can post it on our YouTube channel later for others to view. And a link to the recorded session will be sent out later to you by email. Feel free to share it with whomever you like. If you have any questions during the session or following the session during the Q&A uh, bit, you can use the Zoom chat function. And uh, Stephen Moore will, will facilitate that session following our speaker. We'd like you to note that, stand by. We'd like you to note that uh, closed captioning is available for this webinar. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you will see the closed captioning logo and you can uh, turn that on and the text will show, on, show up at the bottom of your screen. Here's our agenda for this evening. As mentioned, we'll be followed shortly by Michael Mazur, followed by the Q&A session and then a short wrap up and an announcement for our final webinar event for this, this season. As always, if you'd like to be a, become a member of Friends of the Napanee River, you can go to our website noted on this slide and pay by PayPal or charge card. Uh, other, alternatively, you can contact our treasurer at this uh, email address again on this slide. We'd like to remind you that you do not need to be a member to join in on any of our sessions. If you'd like to become a member of Friends of the Salmon River, here are the details. Again, go to the website and you'll find all that detail there, or you can contact the treasurer, Dave, at the email at the bottom of this slide. So this evening, we are honored to have Michael Mazur, who is the Executive Director from Fatal Light Awareness Program Canada, as our speaker. Michael has dedicated much of his life to volunteerism. He is a founding member of FLAP Canada, and he's been with the organization since it began operations in 1993. Michael is an author and regular presenter on the topic of bird building collisions, bringing attention to the reflective light issue that impacts over 1 billion birds across North America every year. His work increasingly focuses on solutions to help mitigate and remediate the challenges of bird migrations in built up environments and building design standards. He's had a significant impact on bird safe building standards and risk assessments in helping to develop the Canadian Standards Association's bird friendly design standard. He also consults with city planners across North America on developing bird-friendly guidelines and standards. Michael is also active in bird rescue and bird recovery patrols in Toronto. He's a contributor to several ornithological papers on bird collisions, and he stays self-motivated with studying bird biology through continuous learning from the Cornell University Lab of Ornithology. On behalf of the Friends of the Napanee River and the Friends of the Salmon River, we welcome you, Michael. Over to you. There we go. I will just quickly show my face here so that people can perhaps make sure it's personal. <laughs> if not, if it's too much uh, of a trouble, don't worry about it. I'm fine leaving it as is. Um, let me start off first. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to switch over to the share screen at this point so that we can uh, start this presentation with a quick video clip. And I'm going to try and make sure that this runs properly so that everyone can hear uh, the uh, quick clip here. It'll give some context to the presentation I'm going to do, and then I'll get right into my slide presentation. Northern Oriole or Baltimore Oriole, just again, 
I'm going to smoke the Northern Flicker. But sadly, we pick up part too many of this particular species. They hit with such tremendous force that they, they tend to die more frequently than some of the smaller species do. The impact is too great for them to sustain. Quite frankly, is it's a, an issue that is it, it really isn't difficult to, to fix. You can see reflections in there. It's not bird friendly at all. Actually, it's it's like a mirror. Many of these birds are endangered, and so if we can build our uh, built environment in a way that reduces migratory bird deaths, it's a good thing. In Toronto, we have so many that towers that are just 100% glass. This building is only 37% glass. That helps with the bird strike issue. It also helps insulate the building, so it's a much better insulated building than you would normally get for a condo in Toronto. So at this particular site, we were finding an average of 100 birds a year. Since these markers have gone up, we've been finding one, maybe two birds a year at this particular facade. So it's, it's definitely doing its job quite beautifully. The less birds that are killed in, by collisions with buildings in Toronto, the more will make it up to the boreal forest to breed. I think that the city of Toronto should be very proud of the work they've done. There we go. I hope everyone was able to hear that. I'm going to turn things off for the moment, just one second. <laughs> oh my goodness. There we go. I just need to get out of this shared screen and we should be okay. All right, so I don't know why I'm getting more videos playing here in the background. <laughs> I'll just turn that off and get to my presentation, okay? Bear with me, almost there. And share. Okay, all these little details we got to get past to at a technical level. Let's go to the share screen, slideshow, start from beginning. Okay, hopefully everyone can see this. Um, so as the uh, uh, presentation introduced you to uh, the various aspects of how cities like Toronto is working towards mitigating this ongoing concern of bird collisions with buildings. I'm gonna kind of start from the beginning, uh, kind of give you more background on FLAP. And as we get in deeper into the presentation, I'm gonna get into examples of what, cities like Toronto, what we're doing to address this particular concern of bird collisions with buildings. So a little bit about FLAP Canada. Uh, FLAP was formed in 1993. We started out as a core group of caregivers on the street, rescuing what birds we could find uh, that uh, would collide with these structures both at night and during the day. But our main focus, funny enough, in 1993 was entirely about lights at buildings because at that time, we saw this as, as a, a much greater concern for bird strikes within the city of Toronto. But what we found is if we stuck around after daybreak, there was this whole other wave of strikes that took place. And this was all about daytime strikes. And we very quickly realized that this particular concern of window collisions during the day was a far greater threat than that of those strikes that were occurring at night. So as I said, we started out very much focusing on just the bird rescue, uh, rehab, rehab and documenting these collisions. <clears throat> but 
But then we began to expand our efforts into education uh, and advocacy. Um, and then lo and behold, we realized after years of working in the field, trying to get people's attention, um, really the only way to truly address this concern was getting guidelines, policies, and standards in place that would somehow enforce change to take place to make the built environment safe for birds. So the various programs that we do, uh, we have other types of aspects within FLAP where we focus on educating the corporate community through our bird safe program. We have our global bird collision mapper, which I'm gonna to touch on a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, we have our global bird rescue event, also I'll touch upon later, and our local um, birds in your hood, which is a children's uh, uh, educational program trying to get children engaged in bird watching and bird conservation. So what you're looking at here <clears throat> is an example of one year's worth of birds that our volunteers uh, had picked up in and around uh, various structures within the GTA. Now, we have roughly 50 to 60 active volunteers on schedules patrolling various buildings, not only in Toronto, but in Scarborough, Mississauga, and Markham. This is not even the tip of the iceberg. Um, but like anything like this, a, a picture tells a thousand words. We, we do an annual bird layout at the Royal Ontario Museum where uh, pictures like this are taken and it's proven to be one of the most powerful, most effective ways to raise awareness on the magnitude of this problem. So our volunteers uh, uh, start the patrols bright and early before daybreak, walk around buildings within the Toronto, Toronto Financial District. And then, as I said earlier, we stick around after daybreak and deal with those birds that are colliding during the daytime. Um, all these birds uh, collide uh, with these structures and are very close to the perimeter of these buildings. And depending on the day and the time of year, we can pick up one or two, we can pick up dozens, sometimes we can pick up hundreds in, in a given day. Um, there's various forms of trauma that these birds experience. Um, this picture you see here of a northern flicker, you can see the tip of the bill uh, was chipped from the impact of the window. Um, with this type of injury, that tip is broken close enough to the tip of the beak that it will eventually grow back. But if they break too close to, to where the, the, the beak meets the fleshy part of the, the, the face, the chances of that bill growing back are near and far apart. Um, the most common form of trauma is head trauma. And that's no wonder because typically that's one of the first things that hits a given surface is, is the head itself. And it would be like you and I running full tilt into a brick wall. So unfortunately brain hemorrhages occur and, and that is the leading cause of death for these birds. Uh, there's this sort of, um, we'll call it a, a, a myth that people, when they pick up a bird that has died from an impact with a window, the neck kind of dangles down. Very rarely, if ever, does a bird's neck break from the impact with a window. The, the, the vertebrae is a very flexible part of the bird's um, anatomy and can, can sustain uh, impacts uh, with these types of, uh, types of structures, with these types of window surfaces. So don't be fooled to think that this bird has died from a broken neck. It's far more likely that it died from head trauma. So our, the, our vehicles will fill with paper bags. We, we help house each live bird that is able to be released um, in individual paper bags and we drive to release sites outside of uh, the given area where we're monitoring and release them back into the natural environment. Any bird that shows any signs of trauma that needs a higher level of care, they're held back and we transport them to local wildlife rehabilitation facilities. Here in Toronto, the most common and largest wildlife rehabilitation facility is the Toronto Wildlife Centre. And they can pick up, can, they can, sorry, admit dozens, sometimes hundreds of birds, as I said earlier, in a single day from our, our bird rescue efforts. The dead birds uh, are donated to the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, that's where that bird layout will take place. And then once we've done that educational layout, uh, each bird is tagged uh, and can be used for a variety of purposes from uh, tissue samples, DNA samples, they create skins out of them uh, for displays in the museum itself. They trade them with other museums. They're used in field studies like wind turbine scavenging rate uh, studies to uh, other types of bird conservation efforts. So the good thing is, as sad as it is that these birds die, uh, we make sure they get uh, uh, put to good use uh, for the purposes of bird conservation. Now, the types of species we encounter, uh, th this is the part that just continues to just uh, blow my mind. Uh, to date, FLAP has picked up 173 different species of birds. Um, so within these 
uh, of species, there are those that are, are high collision uh, threat type birds. Uh, the top of the list for us are the white-throated sparrow, uh, the oven bird, and the ruby-throated hummingbird. Uh, the ruby-throated hummingbird, for those that aren't really avid birders, that's, that's a bird that they're, they're more familiar with. But people don't realize that the massive variety of species that pass through our region during the migration seasons. And if we just took time to step outside during those migrations and just look up into the trees, you know, you'll be amazed at what we, you can see in, in a given day. So here we have, as I said, uh, an example of the more common species. And then there are those at-risk species. To date, of those 173 birds that we pick, uh, have picked up to date, sorry, species we have picked up to date, 25 of them are at-risk species. Now, when I started doing this effort back in, uh, the first time I started doing this was back in 1989. And birds that I was picking up in the streets at, those, at that time weren't considered at-risk species. Now, some of these birds, one by one, year after year, are ending up on the at-risk species list. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we pay attention to this issue. It is considered the second leading cause of bird death across Canada, second only to cats. And, and that is uh, it's getting a, a closer and closer race to being the number one cause of death across this nation. So we really, as I keep on saying, have to pay close attention to this issue. And I'm gonna share with you some of the uh, ways that we've been managing to get some successes. But before we do that, just a little bit of background about um, where birds are more inclined to fly than others. When we look at, at North America, North America is one massive migratory corridor. Um, there are in fact four major migratory corridors, but they overlap each other. And in areas where they overlap, and Toronto is a perfect example of that, it, it increases the, the volume of birds that will tend to pass through and congregate in those areas. And this is one of the reasons why Toronto has such a significant problem is these overlapping corridors, but it's also because any city that sits up against a large body of water um, are far more likely to have a larger potential for birds to collide in those regions. And it's simply because one of the navigational cues that people use, people use, that birds use when migrating are the shorelines of large bodies of water. And Toronto sits right up against the shores of Lake Ontario. So you just have these massive numbers of birds that will flow through the city um, and, and unfortunately, in a modern built environment like Toronto, it just turns into this massive threat for birds. Now, here's the important thing for you to take away from this, this uh, webinar. There's a mind's eye perspective that we, we all have that the taller the structure, the more lethal it is. But the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of bird collisions that occur at any given structure, whether it's a 50 story high rise, or your own home. The, the, the vast majority of these strikes will occur up to roughly 16 to 20 meters above grade. Above and beyond that, the collisions tend to be few and far apart. And this is specifically related to daytime window collisions. When it comes to nighttime, it's almost the opposite happens. The taller the structure and the more brightly lit that structure is, there's a greater likelihood that birds will be attracted to those structures at night. So the message to take away for you here is with your own homes, you are no different in, in many cases than that of a 50 story high rise when it comes to daytime window collisions. So we all play a role in this, in, in resolving this issue. We all have a responsibility to make whatever structures we occupy, whether it's the office buildings we work in, um, industrial buildings, um, government buildings, or our own homes, our own cottages we have to individually take steps to make our own structures safe for birds. And the reason this happens is the birds that we pick up, the vast majority of them are insect, insectivorous or fruit eating or seed eating birds. And the bulk of their food is available within the tree canopies, whether that's right down at grade level or at the very top of those tree canopies. And this shows a scale of those types of species of birds where they will tend to forage for food within those tree canopies. Now, as I, as I mentioned already, uh, statistically speaking, there, there was a study done in 2013, and they used uh, FLAPS data to try and measure the gravity of, of this particular issue of uh, bird collisions with windows during the day. 
homes represent well over 50% of the threat. And that's simply because of volume. There's far more single family dwellings out there with windows than that of commercial structures or government buildings. So the more structures, each having the potential for taking a bird's life, the more likely uh, you know, th th those massive numbers of types of structures like homes will be a, collectively a greater threat. But it's not limited to homes. It's our cottages, it's our condos and apartment buildings, it's bus shelters, it's our own vehicles, even attacking and colliding with our own uh, windows on our vehicles. Uh, wind barriers, sound barriers, uh, transparent railing systems. Transparent railing systems have replaced the spindles we used to see on our decks so that when we're sitting on our deck, we can see through those, through those transparent railing systems, having an unobscured view of the natural surroundings or whatever it may surround your given home or cottage. Um, but then unfortunately, this has made this problem so much worse. Birds are colliding in astronomical, astronomical numbers uh, with these types of uh, transparent railing systems. And then as, I, as we all know, the modern uh, built environment, high rises, low, mid and high rise structures um, are a significant threat to birds as well. The reason for these strikes during the day is two factors. It is the reflective qualities of the glass that deceive the bird into believing they're flying toward their natural environment. Um, even the reflection of the sky, it, it can be, depending on the species, an attractant to the birds, but it is the tree canopies, it is the natural vegetation that is the most deceptive to those birds. And then there is also the, the transparent qualities of glass, where they're seeing directly through one panel of glass to an adjacent side of a building. It could be corners of glass, again, seeing to the adjacent side of that corner of glass, or it could be plants inside given lobby of a high rise or even the plants inside your own home. Uh, they can see directly through those panels of glass to that plant, they will be attracted to it. So let's see here. Now, a little bit about the evolution that's taken place in addressing this issue. The city of Toronto was the first city in the world to introduce bird-friendly development guidelines. And this was just a voluntary uh, uh, educational document that we, at the time, we were offering to industry professionals so that when they were building new buildings to take some simple steps to make that building design safer for birds. So this came out in 2007. And since then, there has just been this boom of cities all over North America that have used these guidelines as a template to create similar guidelines in their own cities. And with that, the city of Toronto has also introduced, and just wanna make sure I'm not jumping ahead here. Let me see what the next slide is. Yeah, so before I get into the details of this next slide, the city of Toronto also introduced mandatory requirements through their green standard, their Toronto green standard, and that was in 2010. So in the city of Toronto, all new low, mid and high rise buildings have to meet bare minimum bird friendly building design in order to be built. So if you get a chance to walk around Toronto now, you'll see all kinds of buildings with patterns on them that have been specifically put there to reduce the threat of bird building collisions. And again, since then, we're seeing all kinds of other municipalities across this nation introduce mandatory requirements uh, for new builds in their cities. Now, as a result of this sort of evolution that's taken place, um, Nature Canada has introduced a bird-friendly city certification program. And we're seeing all kinds of cities across this country adopt this. I think the city of Hamilton just yesterday announced they were certified as a bird-friendly city, uh, certified bird-friendly city. Um, we're seeing all kinds of cities across this nation adopt this approach. And within it, it's, it, it focuses to a great degree on the bird building collision issue. So we're hoping with time, we're gonna see more and more municipalities across this country do very similar things to what's happening here in Toronto. Now, a little bit of, of the evolution of how one of the most uh, groundbreaking steps that took place, which is law. Now this may surprise you, but it is in fact now law uh, um, through the Environmental Protection Act, it makes it illegal to harm or kill a migratory bird due to a collision with a window in the province of Ontario. This also applies federally. 
where any listed species, any at-risk species that collides with the building, one can be held accountable under the Environmental Protection Act if they're not demonstrating in their effort to mitigate that concern. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about this, but where this all sort of started was a, a first a retrofit at a building um, in the city of Markham, where we partnered with the city of Markham to treat given windows at one of their office, not the office buildings, but it was a two-story um, office for, uh, I believe it was, um, I'm just trying to remember what the department of it, doesn't matter. Uh, the important thing is that this particular site was killing roughly hundred birds a year. When the window treatment that you see in this photograph was put up, which was just a series of lines that met what research proven to be effective at reducing collisions, the, the collisions almost dropped to zero. And what was quite interesting is halfway through the installation, uh, uh, sorry, halfway through after the markers have been up, uh, which was roughly six months, one of the seals went in one of the windows that had been treated. The window was replaced with a new one, but the film didn't go back on that particular window for uh, several months. Birds were colliding with that single window. We were finding birds beneath that one window. So we, we were able to prove that there are aesthetically appealing markers proven to reduce bird strikes that were affordable, that could go on, up onto a commercial building that would reduce this threat. Now, the interesting that took place a year later, the first of its kind, it was a precedent setting lawsuit where EcoJustice um, worked with FLAP to uh, bring Menke's development to court over bird death that was occurring at their facility. We were picking up roughly 1500 birds a year at just their two mirrored structures um, and very little effort had been taken to reduce this threat. So the, the lawsuits took place the court decided that based on what was available at the time, um, they were satisfied that the particular building did all they could to mitigate this concern, which was a little bit of an upsetting turnaround. But then uh, midway through the trial, another type of mark was introduced. We partnered with Feather Friendly, or sorry, we partnered with the convenience group to introduce this new dotted pattern where the markers were spaced five centimeters by five centimeters apart. It's just a window film of dots applied to the window. Since those markers went up, we've seen, we've been tracking 80 to 90% reduction in strikes at this particular office complex. The interesting thing about this installation is the management put a damage control program in place to deal with all the complaints they were anticipating getting from their tenants. Up go the markers, not a single complaint, not a single email came in to the management. So the management did a random interview of their tenants asking them, what do you think of the markers on our windows? And the answer was, what markers? So here was a building that fought tooth and nail for years to not put anything up on their windows because they feared it would interfere with the architectural integrity, the beauty of their building. But they, through pressures of going through the trial, they did it anyway. And lo and behold, they learned that the, the concern was a moot point because no one even realized the markers had gone up. Now, the second trial, Cadillac Fairview, Young Corporate Center, same deal. There was all kinds of bird death occurring at this facility. The same outcome took place in this, this trial between Cadillac Fairview and, and, and um, EcoJustice. Um, the interesting thing that came out of this trial was the law. And I'm not sure if the next slide shows this, but they too, uh, just midway through the trial, they put up markers just like Menke's did and lo and behold, success. The strikes were reduced. The interesting thing about this law is they had a series of experts that sat on the stand that were able to demonstrate that once daylight reflects off of a window, it's, refl it's reflected in the form of radiation. Now, within the EPA already existed a section of contaminants where anyone who emits a contaminant that harms or kills a migratory bird and aren't taking mitigative action to reduce that threat can be held accountable under the law. On that list of contaminants is radiation. So this is how the issue of bird building collisions became law, both provincially and federally. Now, very important to point out here, this law, yes, technically can apply to all of us, but it was really designed for those 
those types of structures that are killing large volumes of birds and aren't taking action to mitigate that threat. And the good news is the ministry is actually following through with complaints at buildings where there's large kills taking place and investigating and potentially pressing charges against buildings. The good news is the vast majority of the time that the parties just comply and they treat their windows. So that was a very important slide and background important for you to know. So a little bit about the evolution again, 2007, the first set of guidelines went up with the city of Toronto. Then it became mandatory for the city of Toronto in 2010. The first set of precedent setting lawsuits started uh, in, uh, uh, in 2010 through 2013. Um, then it became law in 2013, as I mentioned in just the previous slides. And then the ministry, they struggled because the way the law is written suggests that each and every one of us is breaking the law. And the ministry did not know how on earth can they enforce a law that everybody is breaking. And they were actually prepared to abolish the law. But we fought tooth and nail and we were able to demonstrate that this can be managed. And part of what happened is Environment Canada hired the Canadian Standards Association to write what's called the Bird Friendly Building Design Standard. Now this standard is voluntary and it's a standard designed for architects, engineers, municipalities to use as guidelines to introduce bird friendly standards in their communities. And uh, so what we're doing is we're trying now to get the building code to adopt this standard. And if, this, if they, they adopt this standard, that means that all municipalities across the province will have to comply and build new buildings with birds in mind. So as a result, uh, and today, funny enough, we just had a campaign uh, of a, a rally at Queen's Park with MPP Chris Glover, um, where a bill has been presented to parliament uh, advocating just for this, to get the building code to adopt this standard. And we're also approaching this at the national level for all building codes across the country to do the same. So any support that you can give in putting the word out there in your community to get your local MPPs to support this is crucial because this will change the landscape in, in this issue, okay? Now, a little bit about how this works. Um, how on earth can you make a window visible to birds without it obscuring our ability to see through that glass. Now, up until uh, 2009, the only real viable products that one could go out and purchase was a bird of prey decal. You'd, you'd buy it, you'd slap it up in your window, and like magic, your problem would be resolved. Well, research has demonstrated time and time again that that technique does not work. The only way for a, a, an approach like that to work effectively is if you cover almost the entire surface of your window with decals. And realistically speaking, it's not gonna work and it'll be aesthetically unappealing. So what research was able to demonstrate, and you've already seen examples of this already, in, in that if you place a marker on a window, you have to make the gaps between each marker tight enough that a bird feels they can't slip through that gap. And they'll try and find a way to fly around that that obstacle to get to what they believe is the real thing. And this is a, just a simplified uh, illustration of how it works. So the gaps can't be any greater than five centimeters apart horizontally or five centimeters apart vertically. It does not have to be a grid pattern. It can be any pattern you want, as long as the negative space of exposed glass doesn't exceed that five centimeter by five centimeter gap, okay? The other thing that's important, oh, something that uh, I, I may have jumped ahead here on, on this particular slide. Um, one of the technologies that's being explored is because aesthetics are so important to people, the industry and even the average homeowner would prefer an invisible fix. And one thing that is growing in, in popularity is the fact that birds see ultraviolet light or see a certain spectrum of ultraviolet light that we as humans do not see. And the idea is that if we can apply patterns, transparent patterns on window surfaces with UV reflective qualities to it that the birds see, 
When we look through that given window, we won't see the markers, but the birds will. And the way this works is if you look at this particular image, the bird on the right hand side it, it is black. And this is how we perceive that bird. But when birds look at each other, the bird on the left is how they perceive each other. That's what the birds see. And that's how the ultraviolet spectrum works. So again, if we can see this technology improved to the point where it actually is proven to work effectively, this will be the future. But for now, we're limited to seeing markers the way um, and, and that we will see on the windows themselves. And this is an example of a product out of Germany. It's a pixie six stick pattern that um, again has UV reflective qualities to it that unfortunately doesn't appear to be working. And this is where more research needs to take place. Okay, and I, I believe eventually we will get there and we will see this become quite common in the future. And this just kind of gives the parameters of the technical side of this that we don't need to get into right now, but it is a very specific wavelength of ultraviolet light that needs to be applied to a window in order for it to work effectively. So the other important aspect of making a marker work effectively isn't just its spacing. It also has to be a full coverage marker. It has to cover the entire surface of the window. And this black dotted pattern that you see um, does work, but because it, in this case, what it's trying to illustrate is it's reflecting a very dark space. And if, that's, if that marker doesn't have a strong enough contrast, it's gonna be difficult for the bird to see. So if, it's, if a window's looking out into a dark area, you need to have a brighter marker so that the contrast is there making the marker more visible. The same thing applies that if it's reflecting uh, uh, an open space or sky, if you have white dots on that given glass, it's gonna be near impossible for the birds to be able to see that marker. So you need to go to that contrast again. You need to go to a darker marker so that the marker becomes more visible, okay? Ideally, uh, a duotone is the best, but it's a really tough sell because then that marker is visible under all varying lighting conditions, which is again, in the best interest of the birds, but aesthetically, people aren't too crazy about it. But this is uh, trying to give you that example of how both light and dark works under varying contrasting conditions. And the images you see on the, on the side here are just various patterns to try and make sure that you understand it doesn't have to be a dotted pattern. It can be any type of shape, any positioning of shape, um, it, uh, as long as it's full coverage and has contrast, it's going to stand out in the bird's eye and have that proper spacing, it's going to be effective at reducing bird collisions, okay? So again, it can be any pattern you want it to be, just the gaps have to be a certain space, no greater than that five centimeter by five centimeter, centimeter spacing. The other important thing to keep in mind, it has to be on the outside surface of your window. The moment you place it on the inside, it becomes almost invisible uh, under certain daylight conditions. And the best example I can give you here, uh, on, on the image you see on the left-hand side, this is outside of a window. Um, you can see inside the building into a living space. At a certain time of day, that glass is entirely transparent. But then as the angle of the daylight shifts, that transparent surface becomes a mirror and it hides whatever is behind it. So unless you put that marker on the glass on the outside surface, you're wasting your time because it's just going to do very little, if any, uh, at reducing bird strikes under the, the uh, right daylight conditions. Okay, now, how did they discover how truly effective a marker needs to be in order to have it you know, work effectively on a given window? There's two different research facilities both of which currently are in the United States. The first one is at Powder Mill, which is a, an operation run by the American Bird Conservancy. And the way it works is there's this long tunnel. And on one end of the tunnel is a, a small opening. The other end of the tunnel has panels of glass. One is treated, the other isn't. And in front of that glass panel is a fine mesh netting. And what they do is they misnet birds they bring them one by one to the opening on one end of the tunnel and they release those birds. And they, they observe as the birds fly down the tunnel if the bird is gonna fly left or right. And they, they measure the percentage ratio and how often, which direction the birds go. 
and they come up with a sliding scale of the effectiveness of a given marker. The problem with this particular technique is the birds aren't responding the way they would in the natural environment. They're first being stressed by being trapped. Then they're being uh, uh, brought to this tunnel and released. So the birds are in escape mode. And the way I, I describe it is a, picture yourself standing on the edge of a cliff. And the, the bottom of the cliff is sand and the other uh, side of the uh, bottom of the cliff are stone. And if you had to choose uh, by someone pushing off that cliff, which direction you're going to want to fall. It, unfortunately, there is flaw in this, and it's just not quite giving an accurate scale. The other approach is out of Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania. And what they do is they set up a series of feeding stations. And just uh, aside from each feeding station are individual panels of glass treated or untreated with markers. And the base of those panels of glass are like these little nets. So these birds, they come to these feeding stations and then they fly away and some end up uh, colliding or not colliding with the treated or untreated panels. And they count the number of impact marks on those windows or even sadly some of those birds that fall onto those, those mesh, uh, mesh uh, baskets at the bottom of each, of each panel. This unfortunately is a far more accurate way of measuring the response of a bird in interpreting a marker on a window. The downside is that some birds do die as a result of this particular approach. So it's a, you know, almost like a pick your poison kind of a decision here. But again, I, I need to reiterate as much as I don't like this, the fact of the matter is this is a far more accurate way of measuring the effectiveness, okay? Now, with that being said, we have seen since the guidelines have come out, since mandatory requirements have arrived on the landscape and now the law, the various industries out there that can produce product to mitigate this concern are beginning to boom. And it's simply because there's now a demand. And we're seeing some incredible designs taking place all across this country, right into North America, introducing beautifully aesthetically appealing patterns on windows. Um, from window films to fritting where they bake the patterns into the glass. There's silk screening and etching patterns in glass, exterior sun shields, uh, grill work. There's all kinds of techniques that we're now starting to see applied to windows, first surface, that are, are having a very positive effect, at not only uh, meeting the demand, but it's, it's proving to, to be effective at reducing bird window collisions. Now, you as homeowners, very important. Uh, some of you, if not most of you, have bird feeders. Typically, the average homeowner places bird feeders in the worst possible locations, anywhere from one meter to five meters of a given window. That's what we call the hot spot, where the, the, the further away you get from the window until you reach that five meter distance, the greater likelihood you're going to have a greater chance of birds colliding. So where you place your feeders is essential. Ideally, place your, fin, win, uh, your bird feeders right up against the window. That may sound crazy, but it has proven to be the most effective distance. And that's simply because birds that are flying to or flying from a feeder don't have the momentum when they have impact with those windows. So um, again, can't impress upon you enough, one meter or less or ideally right up against the windows themselves is the best location for bird feeders, okay? And here are some examples of products and techniques you can try at your own home. There's a shelving paper that you can purchase from Canadian Tire if you want, um, that are designed not for bird window collisions, but have proven to be effective at reducing strikes when applied to the windows of your home. So consider using that as a technique. A whitewashing onto the windows, proven to be effective. Not very pretty, but again, proven to reduce bird strikes. You can draw with oil-based markers on your windows, the one you see of the maple leaves are done by a window marker. Any design you want it to be random, as long as the spacing and contrast is there as mentioned in the previous panels. Exterior blinds and sunscreens can be purchased. A grill work, you can even buy a cable or create your own cable hanging uh, system. This is an example of a product called uh, a copium bird saver, which is highly effective at reducing bird strikes. So these are examples that you can apply at your own home. Um, and there's also uh, dotted window films you can purchase. 
that um, all cost effective, easy to apply and inexpensive to apply. And, and in some cases, aesthetically appealing. So if you're looking to treat windows in your home and you don't already know which windows are potentially the greatest risk, you can use our self-assessment app. It's on our website, birdsafe.ca. It asks some 22 different questions, yes or no questions. And at the end of it, it will tell you if your window is considered a low, moderate, high risk or lethal facade. And we say if any of the ratings come out as lethal, treat those windows immediately. Ideally treat all your windows, but at least start with the lethal facades, okay? And hopefully that will help you as you pursue uh, treating your windows at your home. Now, I mentioned earlier about our event, Global Bird Rescue. This is a program we started five years ago. Um, and the, the goal of this campaign or this, this um, the, yeah, it, it technically is a campaign that we hold each year. Um, this year, it, it's going to be, uh, I think the slide, yes, this slide is correct. It starts February 5th and goes through, sorry, uh, February, October 5th through October 11th. And what it is, it's the seven day uh, uh, bird rescue campaign where we ask people from all over the world to go out into their community during that seven day period, look for birds that have collided with windows and enter them into our global bird collision mapper. And uh, with that, we're, we've just seen this boom. Last year, we were really, really fortunate to see, uh, we had upwards of 50 different teams from across the world participate in this. And we're hoping to, this year, it, it get closer to 100 different teams out there looking for birds in their community all across the planet. Um, but it isn't limited to teams. You as an individual can participate. You can sit in your own armchair at your own home. And if a bird hits your window during that seven day period, enter it into our global bird collision mapper. To date, we have uh, close to 80,000 records now in the global bird collision mapper. And it's proving to be an incredible resource for, for, um, for documenting bird window collisions, okay? So please uh, visit, our, uh, visit the global bird collision mapper at birdmapper.org and you'll be able to learn all about this, okay? Now, why is it so important that we focus on this issue of bird building collisions? We have to remember that birds play a crucial role in our ecosystem. They, they, they consume billions of insects during the breeding seasons. They pollinate plants. They distribute seeds. They provide food for other forms of wildlife and, and predators. But also is the bird watching industry. The bird watching industry is a multi-billion dollar industry across North America. And there's this stereotypical uh, perception of a bird watcher. It's those with binoculars and tilly hats and bird books. Well, guess what? If you have a bird feeder in your backyard, you're a bird watcher. And if you try this yourself, go to any grocery store, go to um, a big box store like Home Depot or, or Lowe's, um, go to even your corner store. Of all the products that they can carry, in their facilities, in their stores, I guarantee you're gonna find one of them is gonna be bird seed. And it's simply because it's a product that flows off of the shelf. So all this money goes into uh, a healthy economic economy for us. So for all these reasons, please support this concern, get the word out there and, and, and try and get people within your own community to make their own homes, their own buildings safe for birds, okay? And with that, um, this is uh, the end of the presentation, and uh, there's uh, various URLs there. You'll see we have five different websites, um, one of which is, um, as I mentioned, the uh, birdmapper.org uh, bird collision database. Okay, we have our global bird rescue uh, website and uh, flap.org and birdsafe.ca. So this, I would think, is the part of the evening where I think there's going to be a Q&A. So I'm going to turn off the share screen here and uh, I am ready for any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Michael. I'm Stephen Moore and uh, I get to do the Q&A. So there were just some excellent uh, questions there. I appreciate it. You could even turn your camera on, Michael, if you're not too shy. Look. I I, uh, I was trying to do that. Yeah, and it's in, not the lower left hand, in the lower left hand corner, there's a little icon that looks like an old time movie camera. Yeah. Well, what I'm saying is when I click that, it says can't start your video because the host has stopped it. 
Ah, well, I guess that's my fault, isn't it? <laughs> I am going to make you a co-host. There we go. And we'll see if now, or just now are you able to- There we are. Ah, excellent. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, do you have any comments about the OPG power plant that is on the lake shore just west of Napanee? Uh, right. Okay, so that, uh, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, this is uh, in around Kingston, is that correct? That's right, yeah. Okay, right, there, there is quite the history um, uh, with that particular facility. Um, let's see here, I'm just trying to uh, get, there we go, the screen set up here. Um, back in 1983, uh, or leading up to 1983, that particular hydro generation station did have a history of bird death occurring at it. Uh, but then in 1993, there was a massive kill that took place. There was over 10,000 birds that were recovered over a single weekend. And this triggered uh, quite an investigation. Um, and uh, the, the government hired, I think his name was Ron Weir. It's been a while since I've talked about this, so I, I could be wrong, but I believe the, the uh, uh, freelance biologist's name was Ron Weir and determined that it was the lighting system, which was no surprise, it used to be a flight lit, uh, they used to be flight lit emission stacks, was the root of the problem. They, they replaced the flight lit emission stacks with strobe lights, and the problem virtually disappeared. And I, a great example I can give of something similar to that is the CN Tower. The CN Tower, years and years after it had been built, was like a large emission stack. They used to flood light that, and it stood out in the night sky and had a horrible history of bird death. They've now gone to actually, you may already be aware of this. It's not, they did have strobe lights, or they do have strobe lights on that structure. They have to by aviation regulations, but they've gone to a cascading light show at that structure where the colors change and frequently change throughout the night. And since they've done that, the strikes have almost virtually disappeared there as well. Wow. Um... I mean that's fantastic that uh, that something as simple as that could uh, could really make uh, the difference. Yes, uh, and uh, it's not really a hard fix, is it? No, it's not. In fact, when you look at all the different environmental issues out there, and there's a lot of them, uh, especially those that are affecting birds, this has got to be the easiest environmental issue to resolve. How often can you say at the flick of a switch and a problem disappears? And that's quite literally what can take place when addressing the nighttime bird building collision issue. Mm -hmm. I find it really interesting that birds see the, uh, a UV slice of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, that mm -hmm. seems to be very um, promising for mm -hmm. you know, people who are worried about seeing something on their windows. Yes. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that there, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Daniel Clem, and he's out of Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania. In fact, the test facility I showed you uh, is his test facility. He has now uh, introduced a window film that meets all the criteria, and his field studies are indicating the birds can, in fact, see these UV patterns that we cannot see. The problem is, and this is the hurdle we're trying to get over, is coming up with an application that can withstand a first surface treatment. UV does not take well to first surface treatments. And, and this is really what's holding this back. So I think once they get past this hurdle of, of finding a durable UV coating for outside surface treatments, you'll see this, this evolution take place with new uh, product uh, uh, arriving on the landscape. Oh, absolutely. It can be done right in the manufacturing process and not uh, a retrofit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you, um, you showed some, I mean, we have the white dot pattern on our windows, um, but you showed some other patterns that were snowflakes or spirals. Now, are those yep. commercially available? Can you buy those kind of patterns? No, those were examples uh, of uh, their customized patterns, okay? Um, and there are, there are more and more companies starting to offer cu custom application treatments. But for whatever reason, and it, it's, it's typical, it's like the bird of prey decal. It was the only product on the landscape. 
for the longest time. And sadly, it really did nothing to resolve the problem. This dotted pattern was the first commercial grade product that arrived on the landscape. And as a result, um, architects just gravitate to it because they know it works. They know it works. And so it's becoming the be all and end all. And I am growing increasingly concerned about this because Toronto, as an example, it's becoming a polka dot city. <laughs> mm -hmm. there's, there's dots everywhere. And it, when something becomes as common as that, people get tired of it. And it could be the downfall. And this is why it's so important that people take a chance and do custom treatments. Come up with your own aesthetically pleasing pattern that lends to the beauty of your building that isn't limited to dots. And, and be creative. Now, I've, I've said it for the longest time. Treat your window like a canvas and come up with some beautifully uh, well thought out designs that meet the criteria. And we'll, we'll see this last well into the future. Actually, it, that's called first mover advantage. The first product in a particular niche market usually dominates unless it's terrible. And uh, that's exactly what you're describing, eh? That's right. That's There's right. A, 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 someone has asked, can a black marker go inside the second story of a home? A black marker on inside. Inside okay. the windows, a black marker. Right. Inside. Yeah, unfortunately, um, again, there, there's two issues with that. The first surface of the glass will continue to reflect. The other problem is typically a dark marker looking into a dark space, you won't see it. You simply won't see it. <clears throat> and it, it's simple. We're no different to the birds. You put something up on your window, if you can't see it, the birds can't see it. Mm. The stronger the signal, the more obvious that marker becomes, the more effective it's going to be. So that's why it became so important to do first surface treatments. And I'll give you a great example of this. When we first worked with the first set of standards for the city of Toronto back in 2009, where it became mandatory, they allowed for second surface treatments. And, and we said, look, if you do that, the first surface is going to reflect. But they didn't want to push the uh, industry professionals too hard. They wanted to give some allowance because at the time, the technology didn't exist to offer first surface treatments of a commercial grade product. So up go these new markers meeting the, uh, meeting the Toronto standards and some were putting slightly uh, reflective glazings on the first surface. The markers disappeared. And these architects were getting, and, and uh, developers, they were getting so frustrated because they were meeting the standard, but they were learning was doing nothing to reduce the threat to birds. So they spent this increase in cost to make no difference. So this is where it became so important for it to be first surface. And as soon as it became first surface requirement, guess what? Industry figured out a way to create product that could withstand exterior applications. And we're now seeing all kinds of a product appear on the landscape that's meeting this criteria. Hmm. Um, do you, I know you don't, don't like the white dots, but are there obvious places where they, those little white dots can be purchased? Are they generally oh, yeah. available? Right, so let me, let me make sure I make something clear here. I love the dots, <laughs> I do, I love them. I'm just growing concerned that if everything becomes dots, there's going to be a problem, okay? Um, so for a homeowner, yes, there is something called a residential do it DIY tape, and it's offered by a company called Feather Friendly Technologies. Um, and you can gain access through our website, or you can just type in Feather Friendly. You'll, you'll find the website where you can purchase this product. Now, the way it arrives, it's in the roll of a, almost like a, a narrow roll of scotch tape. Mm -hmm. And on this roll of scotch tape are a series of markers of these little cubed dots. You rub that tape in rows on your glass, spacing it every five centimeters apart. You peel the tape away and only those dots stay on the window. Each package covers roughly the same, the equivalent of a sliding patio door unit. And I think it's $18 a roll. It's, it's cheap. And they, they'll ship it right to your house. 
<laughs> for goodness sake. So there's no reason for us not to, to embrace something like this because it is, it's incredible at reducing the bird collision problem for both homes and commercial buildings. Mm -hmm. um, I know if you, if you combine, uh, you know, it must have contrast and if you can see it, the birds can see it and, you know, be creative. It's probably a good idea to do a very small part of a window first before you do the whole right. thing, eh? Yes, yeah, and, and listen, we're, none of us, I shouldn't say none of us, no, we're not all artists, right? So, um, you know, it, it depends on, it also depends on how important the aesthetics are to, to a homeowner. I'll, I'll tell you a little story that to this day reminds me that we're all in this same sort of umbrella of not wanting to take away from the beauty of our, even our own homes. I got a phone call from a lady leading up to the Christmas holidays about seven years ago. And this poor lady was in tears on the phone, trying to start a sentence to explain to me that her patio window has killed yet again another bird. I can't take it anymore. Tell me what to do. I'll do it. I don't care what it costs. Just tell me what to do. So I went about explaining to her what she can try. And then I noticed that the tears had stopped and then she interjected and she said, look, I really appreciate what you're saying, but I can't do what you're suggesting. I have guests coming over on Friday, <laughs> right? And it, it, all of a sudden, this, this emotionally heart rendering experience for this lady disappeared because aesthetics became more important, right? So this is why we're, we're trying to come up with aesthetically appealing patterns that gives it more buy-in. And, mm -hmm. and, but the average homeowner, if they're not worried about it, get a bucket of white paint, dilute it with water and brush it on your windows, right? You'll solve the problem, okay? I know with our white dots, uh, most people don't see them, but the people who do and ask about them and then we explain it to them think that it's pretty cool, actually. And, uh, yeah. you know, there, it's a, it turns out to be a positive thing rather than a negative thing. Exactly. And, and you know, e even when you install it, the first couple of days, you'll likely see the markers, but your eye gets used to it. Yep. And it just becomes part of the backdrop. Yep. Now, I was thinking about the, the, um, <clears throat> the distance of a feeder from a window. So I guess the bird feeders that attach with suction cups to the window um, are just fine. Yes, they're, they're, they're excellent, actually. Um, and, and a little bit more detail about that. Anyone that has a bird feeder um, could very well have at some point in time experienced a sharp-shinned hawk or a cooper's hawk, hawk while racing through their backyard and take out a morning dove or one of the birds that are frequent visitors at your feeder. This is another reason why birds collide with your windows at your home. You're attracting these birds to your property. They're frequently visiting that location and the Cooper's hawks and the sharpshin hawks very quickly learn that this is an alternative food source for them, right? So when a Cooper's hawk comes racing through your backyard, they just all scatter. And this is where collisions occur as well. So if that is to occur, by having the bird feeders right up against the window, they only glance the glass and it gives them a chance at getting away uninjured, right? So very important, close as possible to the window is ideal. Mm -hmm. Now we have another question. Does the window frosting adhesive work the same way as a diluted white paint would? Yes, it could help for sure, definitely. Um, again, the, the way to measure the potential effectiveness is, is take a look at applying, just put a small sampling of it up on your window and see how much of it you can see. Um, etching pa etched patterns in glass, whether it's window film or actually etched into the window itself, there's a company out of Montreal called Walker Glass that sells a product called, um, or what is it called, Avi Protec. And it's etched patterns in windows um, have proven to be effective. But again, the co visual contrast strength isn't quite as good as say that of a, a bright white marker. Um, uh, it just pops out more in, in the eyes, okay? Uh, for both humans and birds. So, um, but not to say that that's to discourage you from using a, a, an etched window film if you're prepared to, to work with a product like that. It should have some, uh, positive effect of reducing strokes. 
Now that was AVI, AVI as in avian, AVI Protect? Correct, Pro Protech. Protech. Yes. Okay. And uh, yeah, Walker Glass is the name of the company. The problem with that is it is the window itself we're talking about. It's an integral part of the window. So that would be more applicable if one is planning to change the window in their home or perhaps build a new home uh, and introduce that type of glass to the, to the design, okay? Okay. Um, do you know if, <clears throat> I mean, you talked about Markham and Toronto. Do you know if local municipalities or smaller municipalities are, are uh, taking action? Yeah. Um, well, if we just, just take a look at, say, the southern Ontario region, we now have uh, the city of Toronto and, and the greater Toronto area focusing on this issue to a great degree. We have the city of Markham now has mandatory requirements. We have Mississauga with voluntary. Um, we, we are seeing uh, the city uh, or the town of uh, Whitby and Ajax introducing guidelines and standards. The city of Vaughan which is responsible for, I think, nine. I think they have nine individual municipalities. They're now making it mandatory for all nine of those municipalities. So the entire sort of GTA and outlying areas is spreading. Uh, both small, mid, and large communities are now introducing these types of uh, guidelines into their community. Well, this is fabulous, Michael. I want to thank you very much. Um, I've learned quite a bit and I'm going to, we'll make some modifications here based on what you said, uh, because awesome. there's nothing worse than that dull thud and uh, that you hear, and then, uh, you go out and look for the bird. It's, uh, it's just not a good feeling at all. No, it's not. It's a horrible and, feeling. <laughs> and I'll just remind everyone that, uh, a record, this recording will, uh, you will be sent a link to this recording. It'll also be on the Friends of the Napanee uh, website so that you can pick up some of the uh, URLs and links that were made. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Lawrence, who I have made a co-host. So you should be, all right, very good. <laughs> all right, well, thanks very much. So I guess on behalf of all those who attended, Michael, we'd like to extend our sincerest appreciation for doing a deep dive into this rather disconcerting issue. I think it's particularly important at this time when migration is, as they say, in full flight from the South. <laughs> For many of us who live in rural areas, sometimes we tend to forget how big an issue this can be and how big a contribution Flap Canada in particular is making in not only conducting patrols, but as importantly, educating the public on the big issues and what we as business and homeowners can do to mitigate the rate of bird collisions. I encourage all of our participants tonight, along with your children or grandchildren, to learn more by going to Flap Canada's website, where there's a treasure trove of information. I personally liked FLAP's app and the Global Bird Rescue Campaign in October. I look forward to that as well. So many thanks, Michael. And thank uh, you very much. We'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. So our final event for this year's winter speaker series will be on Tuesday, April 26th, when Friends of the Salmon River will be hosting Jess Husky from Bella Bella, British Columbia, who will be speaking on combating climate change and colonialism through land-based healing and education. As always, we'll send out the details for that event by email and using social media. You'll also be able to find information on the Friends of the Salmon River or Friends of the Napanee River websites. At the request of Jess, this event will not be recorded given some of the sensitive nature of some of her content. Actually, yeah, I've I've, uh, I've seen Jess in a uh, Zoom, and she is fabulous, absolutely full of energy and enthusiasm. So it would be a good idea to make this one in person if you can. Thanks for that, Stephen. So many thanks for joining us this, this evening, and we sincerely hope that you and your families remain safe. Good night to all.